Number one, find all the cross pieces before you start solving. When an advanced cuber looks at the scrambled cube, they will always find all of the cross pieces before starting their solve, and then just solve all of them at once. This can seem like an impossible level of planning, but it's much easier to reach that level if you begin early with good habits and find all the cross pieces before you start solving. Even if you cannot plan what to do with every single piece, just knowing where they all are can really help out. With the beginner method, the easiest one to solve is red because we just put it under red and move it up. And before doing that, if you just look at your other cross pieces, you can see that green is roughly gonna stay here and blue starts on the right side of red and it's not going to change that. So when once you move up red, you can then just select to do green or blue without having to look around the cube again for your next piece. Finding all the pieces before you get started can also help you avoid to tunnel vision on the easiest case and instead try and set up an easier entire cross. In this example, a lot of beginners will start by solving red, but you can notice first that orange and green being right next to each other is really convenient for later. So if we do that first and then solve red, the cross gets much easier. And once you solve red, green, and orange, you don't have to look for blue because we know that it was just right here from the start. If you start every solve by finding your cross pieces and trying to keep track of roughly where they are, it makes piece relationships much easier to visualize in the future. One common technique is solving one piece in order to replace a different piece so that can be solved more easily. It's very hard to see these things if you always focus on one piece at a time. Number two, proper turning technique and finger tricks. You want to turn the cube fast, so you have to avoid wrist turns like this. The best way to hold the cube is with thumbs on front and middle and ring finger on the back. We're still going to use wrist turns, but only for the right side and the left side. No other turn is allowed to be wrist turn. Instead, you turn the top with your index fingers. You turn the bottom with your ring fingers. The front can be done with index finger or thumb with either hand, depending on the situation. With just those simple turning techniques, you can do a lot of algorithms quite quickly. Those are just the basics, and of course there is more to learn, like double flicks, and double flick on the bottom, and turning the front like this, turning the top like that, middle layer turns, double middle layer turns. The most basic turning technique and finger tricks will get your algorithms decently fast, but you definitely can get them faster with more advanced finger tricks, and that is something to learn later on. You should not learn all of it at once, but if you want to see what they are, then you can check out my finger tricks video. Number three, get a good speed cube. The cube that I use is custom set up by Speed Cube Shop and is linked in the description. It is $25, which is on the slightly cheaper end. There are a lot of good cubes you can get at varying price ranges, and if you have any of these, then they are probably good enough. If you have a cube and you don't know if it's good, it should be able to corner cut, which means turning when not aligned. This is called regular corner cutting, and this is called reverse corner cutting, where that piece should get caught, but it just goes anyway. Also, it needs to be able to turn relatively fast, and you don't want pieces popping out on their own. And you want it to be lubed. I like weight one as a general purpose lube and lunar if you want a cube to be faster than it already is. If you don't lube your cube, it builds up dust and slowly goes from good to bad. Sorry, I couldn't find my Rubik's brand. This is my Rubik's impossible. Having a cube that doesn't turn well will force you to constantly realign because it just doesn't corner cut, so you'll make a lot of habits of slight readjustments, and that is just not something that you need to do on a speed cube, and it will slow you down. So get a good speed cube and learn how to do stuff properly. Number four. Look for patterns when memorizing algorithms. Algorithms can be very long and memorizing all that information many times over can be very difficult without some memory shortcuts. One technique is looking for hand movement patterns. How I memorize this algorithm is I start by moving the right side up, turn the top twice, and now it's just going to be alternating right hand up and down twice, and the left hand is just going to move one at a time. So it's gonna be two here, and then push once, two here, push once, to here, and then once you get to this point, then you do double turn and this. So there's the entire midsection, which is just repetition, and the beginning and end are just reverses of each other. Another technique is watching blocks. So as we do this algorithm, I'm going to watch the front left block and see where it goes. So I do the front turn, and then I'm gonna move it in here, turn the top with my left hand, I just memorized that, and then move this one back and undo that front turn. In the second half, I watch this pair. I'm going to take it out like this, and then put it back in like this. In some algorithms, you can use both techniques. The JPerm has the four moves from the beginner method, but it also has a really similar thing right before it, which you can do like this with your left hand doing that. Then your left hand just does the same thing right here. 
And that covers the first eight moves. The last few moves are just solving this block to the square, and then putting this one back where it is solved. Number five, what to do when you cannot find a piece. With practice, you'll be pretty good at noticing the pieces you want that are in view and just solving them. But if you don't see the piece that you want, then you need to know where your blind spots are. If you are solving the cross and you don't see your last cross piece, your blind spot is the four pieces at the back. Ideally, you should follow tip number one and have tracked all your cross pieces, but even if you didn't, then you can know right away it is just at the back. And if you are looking for a piece that goes with this and you can't find it, then it, of course, is going to be at the back because those are the pieces you cannot see. Number six, reduce cube rotations. A cube rotation is just turning the whole cube to help you find pieces or reposition your hands. We want to avoid cube rotations because they are slow and don't accomplish any turns on the cube. One example of how to avoid cube rotations is during the first two layers, no matter what method you use, you want to turn the top to help you find new pieces. Usually just turning the top will help you find pieces you want, and if you did a cube rotation instead, you could still find it, but that is just slower. And same idea for the last layer, you don't have to do this before making the cross on top. Instead, you can just turn the top and then start. Number seven, do timed solves and untimed solves. If you wanna get faster, of course you have to time your solves because you have to know how fast you're going and whether something you're doing is or isn't fast and you also need to force yourself to go fast and that is what the timer is for. However, the timer can also be your worst enemy. As a speedcuber who's trying to improve, your goal should be to get as fast as possible eventually. But what happens for a lot of cubers is as soon as you put a timer in front of them, the goal becomes make this solve as fast as possible. And you see the pros solving the cross on the bottom, but maybe you'll just do cross on top for now because you're not very good at cross at the bottom. Oh, this f 2 case, you learned how to solve it recently, but you can't remember right now, so maybe you'll just do the old way that you used to do it. If you take the timer away, it makes it much easier to think clearly about what you should be doing, and that is solving the case as efficiently as you know how to do. Practicing without a timer makes it much easier to do what you think you should be doing instead of just what you are used to. Now, that doesn't mean an untimed solve needs to be a slow solve. You can still try to do it fast, but stop if you're in a moment where you think you could do something better. Like right here, do I really need to look at this side or can I just deduce that that is red and move on to solving it? These are the little thoughts that you can have in untimed solves and not be punished for, while if you are timing yourself then it makes it really hard to think this way. Number 8. Learning something new will make you slower. And that is okay. This is a type of comment I get on my F2L videos all the time. Why does learning F2L make me slower? I just want to do my beginner method stuff one piece at a time. Well, the thing with F2L is at first it feels like, okay, put this at the specific spot and then move it that way and then get the corner on top of it, move it back, and then solve this case which goes like that. But eventually it becomes, oh hey, it's this one. I know how to do that one. I also know how to do this one. This also applies to last layer algorithms. I need this edge here and they swap. I need these two corners to swap. Okay, I will do the one that goes like this with the left hand here, then with the left hand here, and then solve this block, and then solve this block, and now I am done. But eventually it's just, oh, that pattern, I do this thing. Learning anything new is going to make you slower because you have no practice in it. In fact, I made a whole video where I just did a bunch of technically easy challenges, but I failed pretty hard at a lot of them just because they were new to me. The only way to overcome this is practice and repetition. Number 9. Being color neutral. A lot of people, including myself, teach by starting with the white cross. I think it's just like the normal thing everyone does, but if you want, you can of course start with any color because there's nothing better about starting with white. So if there's an easier cross on a different color, of course you can do that. But if you are not used to it, it is not gonna make you any faster in the moment because you're gonna have to start filtering for that color and not the color that you are used to. If you want to become color neutral, no matter what level you are, it's going to take a lot of practice getting used to the new cross colors and being able to filter for this color as well during the rest of the solve. Of course, in theory, being color neutral is just better, but it depends on what your goals are. You can still reach world class level without being color neutral, and you can get most of the benefits of color neutrality by just learning two opposite side cross colors and not worrying about the other four. Number 10. Know what your goal is. If you just want to be able to solve the cube, then you can stick with the beginner method and maybe even some shortcuts, and that, with a lot of practice, will take you to sometimes solving it in under one minute. 
Since you clicked on this video and made it this far, I'm guessing you want to be decently fast, at least to the point where you are very impressive at parties and people do not get bored waiting for you to finish solving, then you probably want to average under 30 seconds. You should move past the beginner method and I have tutorials on my channel for how to learn the CFOP method. You can get decently fast with the beginner method, but if you're going to practice a lot to make this a good skill of yours, then there's really no point in keeping that limit on yourself. But with that being said, if you want to watch a total beginner try to solve it in under one minute in a week, then check out this video here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.